Hi everyone, thanks for joining. This is Seeking Sustainability Live. I'm JJ Walsh, your host in Hiroshima, Japan, and I'm so excited we have a visual of Ebony Brown, who's joining us today from Tokyo. Thank you so much for joining, Ebony. Thank you, I'm really excited to be here. I'm glad we worked out those technical difficulties. Oh my gosh, that was so frustrating. We were all ready to go last <laughs> night. We could hear you perfectly. We just couldn't see you. Yeah. And one of the things that we definitely want to see is you. <laughs> I am a sight to behold. No. <laughs> oh, well, the, one of the things that I think you're so inspiring for me and so many other women in Japan is that you put yourself out there. You are bold, colorful. And I think this is something that living in Japan as a woman, as a foreign woman, especially, that you, there's no way you're going to blend in, right? No, never. There's nothing <laughs> about me that is, um, I would say similar to what is considered like the ideal Japanese woman.、Um, I'm not very petite, I'm not very thin, I'm not very short,、um, you know, I'm biracial, so I'm not very pale.、Um, you know, I, do, I would never fit into one of their boxes、um, at the beginning.、Um, and it, that doesn't mean there wasn't a time where I didn't attempt to try.、Um, there were Plenty of years where I worked really hard to try to meet a certain kind of aesthetic that I thought would be more appealing to the people in Japan. Not necessarily the more、um, tame versions of those. I was definitely more into like gyaru fashion,、um, big blonde hair, lots of eyeliner, very sexy clothes, or like the visual K look, very like pierced up and brightly colored clothing and harajuku. But,、um, It was still very much trying to find a box within Japan that I felt like I could force myself into, and that included like my body composition and my weight,、um, and just trying to be more like what I thought would make me appealing here.、Um, and then I got to a point where I just really didn't want to be anybody but myself.、Um, and so while everyone knows I very much love gothic fashion, I love darkness and all those things, I also wear a lot of color,、um, surprisingly. People are pretty shocked by that. But、um, I feel like I go through moods and I go through these feelings and changes. And so I try to reflect that in what I wear.、Um, it's part of my idea that you need to romanticize every part of your life. And so my wardrobe is a reflection of my feelings. That's awesome. I love that it's impossible, I think, to put you in any box. And you seem very happy to be in lots of different boxes. And that's fantastic. I love to see that in Japan because I think even though foreigners usually stand out no matter what you do, you just embrace it and own it. And it empowers everybody else, even Japanese people who don't. Fit in completely.、Yes. And I think that's so important.、Uh, before we continue, I just want to mention that in honor of your awesomeness <laughs> as the best Fami Masak poster that, I have but... ever seen,、uh, look at this, guys. It's just awesome.、Uh, Fami Masaks is a bit of a trend going on on Twitter in Japan. And Ebi, you have owned it. You have the best. Images on Twitter. I just love them so much. So I thought today it'd be fun if we give away some、oh, Fami、cool. Masak. So I have、yes. some right here. And if anybody, if you want your pair of Fami Masaks just for yourself to wear in style wherever you are in Japan or around the world, just write socks in the comments <laughs> and I will enter you in the drawing at the end. So I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> Yeah, that outfit was、uh, inspired by Daphne from Scooby Doo. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. And、uh, yeah, did, you got a lot of traction on Twitter with those. Yeah, it was really funny. My friend sent me a post and she says, If you Google Family Mart socks, you're the first picture that pops up. <laughs> I went, Well, that's going to be my claim to fame. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. You, you own the hashtag, I think. Every time anybody puts Femi m a s a k s in the hashtag, you come up. Femi m a s a k s And we, we are、up. not sponsored by Femi m a s a k s but I think, <laughs>、no. 
I think you should be. You should I be. I would appreciate it. I am a loyal customer. <laughs> now we have a great comment from David Osaka. A uh, great Twitterer, Ebony is awesome. She speaks her mind, and I envy that. Yeah, I, Thanks, I feel Dave. like people. I think we get into the the habit of um, kind of filtering ourselves um, because everyone doesn't want you know someone to eventually use what they say about themselves as a weapon in the future. But I think when you really own like who you are and if you're confident in who you are, and even that means your mistakes as well, um, then no one can really weaponize your truth. And so I'm very open about my past with like, I don't drink because I had a problem with over drinking. And it was a thing that was very much encouraged in Japan. You know, no miho dai, drink all you want, party, party. And when you come here, it's kind of just like what you do. You, you know, lots of people, you get a teaching job and you party. Um, and for many of years, I wasted, I feel like I wasted a good portion of my life, you know, just partying it up. Um, but I learned a lot from those mistakes. Um, and so I think like you just have to own what you've done. Um, and I know that that can be a sticky issue in Japan because you never know who can try to use those things later to tell someone about a future employment position or whatever. And I'm a mom, so I also am cognizant of like how much do I want to put on the Internet um, where my child may be able to see it in the future. But I don't ever want him to feel like he has to hide anything from me. And so I try to embrace that by being radically honest. Yeah, I think that's it's so important. And maybe it's our our generation of parent. We we can do that more comfortably. I feel like my yeah. parents, there was always a big gap in their generation between what parents could communicate with their kids about like it's a I'm the boss and you do what I say kind of experience and and I've always I've tried to you know create boundaries but you try to be more honest and a supportive of your kids as little people not yes. just not just your property right yeah I often say like you know my child is the coolest person I know um because he teaches me a lot about just who I am and how I was raised. My mother grew up in the 50s. Um, she was very traditional. And I don't really think she understood or had the tools to really like emotionally connect the way that I needed to be um, supported. And I don't feel like she got that. And so it's kind of just passed down. But I don't want my child to feel like they can't talk to me and that I also feel like when we separate ourselves so much from our children as I am the boss and you are the child, we create this dynamic where children don't really see us as full humans. We're like mini gods or deities or something. And so then when we grow up and our parents ultimately are human and flawed and have their own issues and their own problems, it's hard for us to really like empathize with them. And it has taken me a really long time to forgive my mother and forgive like my parents for their lack because I didn't see them as humans. I saw them as my parents. And um, as I've gotten older and seen places where I lack, I've been able to embrace them as humans. And that has been really um, fundamental for my healing journey of like, my mom did the best she could with the tools she had. Um, and the only way I can really like fix what I lacked was to give that to my child, to give them the things that I felt like I didn't receive. That's so important. And that's that's something I was talking this morning about um, sustainability and the reason I wanted to focus on sustainability in my podcast and in my life was because I make that promise to my kids that I want their future to be better than mine. And so that's why I'm invested in trying to make our society better, trying to make our environment better for them. You know, like I'm really thinking about that. And just imagine if all the company leadership was also thinking the same way. What a, a much better world we'd have, right? Awesome. Yeah, I definitely think people need to think not just about ourselves. I'm just impressed every single day by the generation that is coming up after ours. They seem like they're really trying to be more understanding, more empathetic, more open. And I mean, I'm sure that they'll also have their hangups and their issues, but I don't think we've seen a generation in a long time that has just really embraced trying to understand other people. Yeah. 
One of uh, the things, since I've got the picture on the screen now, can you talk to us about making your own clothes and crafting? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's so, you're so talented. And I love these elevator shots that you share on Instagram. They're awesome. Yeah. Um, so I learned how to sew when I was around 14. Um, it was one of the things I picked up because I grew up in Compton, California, which is a um, kind of infamous for being quite dangerous. Um, and so I didn't have a lot of going outside outlets. Like my mother was a bit overprotective, so she didn't really want me out. Um, she was trying to protect me. So I had to find a lot of like indoor inside um, kind of hobbies. And so I got into like reading and crafting and sewing. And um, my high school actually offered a program where you could learn clothing construction and like get certified, like um, where you could work in factories if you wanted to. Um, so I took four years of that. And then after I took an extended break when I first moved to Japan, but um, then I really got back into making clothes. Um, obviously um, there's not a lot of variety in terms of sizing in Japan. Um, and I also tend to like, um, different kinds of clothing that's readily available. I'm not a huge fan of beige. <laughs> um, so I started making some of my own clothes again and then um, kind of working with friends in the drag community, making costuming for them. I've done some work with um, some brides who were having international marriages who wanted to use like fabric from their husband's home countries for wedding dresses and those kinds of things. Um, just kind of working with people who otherwise wouldn't really find what they would want in Japan. Um, I don't really take as many commissions anymore because it's a lot of time and effort and I work full time. Um, it's more like a labor of love. I just sew when I want to stress relief or um, when I care about somebody, I'll make them something. It's kind of how I show that um, I care about you or I like you as a person. <laughs> Yeah. How have you, I mean, that's awesome that you're so creative and you can make so many clothes that, that not only fit you, but that suit you and, and display your personality to the world. I love that. And I, I think that's a great thing about Tokyo, that Tokyo has a lot of local people living there, yeah. international and Japanese, who are also doing the same thing. They're really trying to express their individuality. Yeah. Have you found that living there? Yeah, um, honestly, when I first moved to Tokyo, um, about, I want to say it's been almost eight years now, um, I had lived in Nagoya for five years, and I loved Nagoya. Um, I'm probably the biggest Nagoya stan on the planet. Um, I had a lot of good friends in a lot of different subgenres, and, you know, Nagoya is small, so you really just get interconnected. Everybody kind of knows each other. And then I got married, and I moved to Tokyo, and I had a baby fairly soon after, like a year after, and I was fairly disconnected from everyone. Um, I really didn't feel like I had a community, and then I had a failed marriage. And then when my marriage ended, I basically was just in survival mode, you know, making sure that my child was taken care of and that I worked through custody issues and um, making sure that I had a home and all of those things. And so for a number of years, I kind of just existed in Tokyo. I didn't really live here. Um, but in the last few years, um, partly because of Twitter as well, I've made a lot of friends in a lot of different areas. Um, and I feel like I either attract or I'm attracted to people who are really living in their truth, whatever that may be. So I've made friends in the drag arena and like a lot of friends in like the music arena, lots of artist friends who are like photographers or making clothes or illustrators or just people who really... I like are embracing their own spirit. And um, I think I really do have to say a lot of that has come from Twitter. Like I'm the first person who's all about meeting my online friends in real life. Um, and that has definitely served to surround me with like just some amazingly talented people. And I, I love the variety of your looks. Like you really changed your style. <laughs> you go you go to different different parts. Like you'll do yeah. kawaii fashion, goth fashion, and then you look amazing in Japanese kimono as well. Like you can you can do everything. Are you have you ever studied or um, you have interest in makeup design as well? No, I just I just like it's like a hobby. I really like, I, I like to create a world. And so 
if I wake up with an idea, sometimes I'll dream an outfit or I'll dream an idea and then I feel the need to make it. So like a lot of the um, like the hair flowers and stuff I wear, I make all of those myself. Um, if I get an inspiration, a lot, I thrift a lot um, because I don't really want to buy any new clothing if I can help it. Um, so I spend a lot of time going through like secondhand shops. I spend a lot of time going through like resale online places um, to create an image. Um, I do own a lot of clothing. I recognize that. Um, and so I have to figure out a way, the best way to offset the fact that I own a lot of clothing and fabric. And so what I do is um, I give away stuff constantly. Um, and so sometimes I'll wear something like three times or two times because it was a look and I needed to achieve it. It's like an artistic vision for me. It's not just an outfit. And then later on, I'll recycle those parts to give to other friends or um, use them in a different outfit in a different way. Gorgeous. Um, I think that's so that's so closely tied to sustainability, yeah. but that is also tied to higher quality clothing, don't you think? Yeah. Like it, unless you're going to spend an absolute bomb at some high end brand. Um, the reason to invest in your clothing is to wear it a long time. Yes. But often we lose the the interest in wearing certain things, but it's still good. So when you pass it on to recycle shops or you can find these gems at recycle shops, it's so fun, so much yeah. more fun than new clothes, right? I, I really think that um, one of the best things about Tokyo is that there are just so many recycle shops. The green dress that I wore in my family mart look, I actually picked up for 280 yen at a recycle shop outside my station. I didn't know why. I was just like, oh, that is a really fabulous green. And I thought it looked good with my hair. And it just so happened two months later that there's like this family mart sock trend. And that was really serendipitous. But um, I just buy pieces that I feel have character, um, that are quality made. Um, I try as much as possible not to support too many fast fashion brands because I feel like a lot of the clothing is one super like the quality can't keep up with how fast they are making workers work. So I don't really like when people say like, oh, well, fast fashion is poorly made or fast fashion is cheap. Um, no, fast fashion is fast. And if you've ever made clothing, then you know that actually to create a quality garment, you need quality materials and you need time. And those workers who are working extremely hard aren't afforded that. Um, and so that affects their work. So I always want people to keep in mind that when they're talking about fashion and clothing, that there are people behind that. There's no way to automate making clothes. Clothing is all handmade. When people say, oh, you're, you're a hand, you make handmade clothing, I go, no, I make my own clothing, but all clothing is handmade. Um, and so I try to honor those workers who are putting their sweat and blood and tears into these garments by buying things from recycle shops so that they get a second life because too many things end up in landfills, but all of those garments that end up in landfills were also handmade by someone. That is such a good point. And I think people don't, don't realize that we're not using machines no. to make garments yet. Like no, there is no all. machine that can do that or shoes. Like people have to make people these. People make it's these insane. things. Um, yeah. And I have had people ask me like, oh, can you teach me how to sew? And I'm like, okay, sure. And most people give up because I don't think people even realize the sheer amount of work it takes to make something as simple as a t-shirt. Like, yes, it's great that we can buy like a t-shirt. And I understand like, especially for size inclusiveness, like fast fashion is sometimes the only thing available in Japan for people who are over a size like eight even, um, or you have to be super rich. So there's a whole lot of layers there, but as much as possible, if we can try to figure out things like clothing swaps, um, recycle shops, just anything we can to make sure that like the longevity of clothing is um, extended, I think is great. I'm constantly on Twitter like, hey, do you want some clothes? Or like people come to the house like, hey, please leave with this bag of clothing, whatever you want. Um, because then that way I can be like, okay, well, I don't feel so bad about buying something new for a new look because I know that I've helped these clothes to keep having a life. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, before we move on to other photos, I want to mention that you're dressed as a goth. You embrace yes. goth fashion. Yes. But even though goth is like really focused on death, you are wearing a mask to present to prevent yourself from getting COVID. And yes. I just I love <laughs> 
I love that juxtaposition of, uh, you know, the goth fashion, but using the math because I'm sensible, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think people, like, I think goth people, we we do have a, a an attraction to, like, the morose, the macabre, um, but we also don't want to die. We, we're not, um, we're not chasing death. We just understand that death is an inevitable part of life and this darkness, this death, this macabreness, this moroseness, this melancholy, all of those things are there because if they weren't, there would be no way to appreciate happiness or joy or light or, you know, all of the things that make life beautiful. I think there's a, a really passion to see the other side of it that there has to be this like yin yin yang there has to be this balance um and i find that the darker i dressed i am the the more light i feel it's a really strange <laughs> balance but um just embracing that side kind of brings out my appreciation for the sun and the flowers and the trees um the juxtaposition and maybe the gap um kind of highlight it for me um but yeah i definitely think people should be wearing masks and um you know, taking care of ourselves now because the, this is a, currently we don't have any other alternatives. Um, and masks can be made fun too. You can put like a cool mask, put a regular mask and then put a cool mask on top of it or put a cool chain or something. Um, I miss makeup just like everyone else. Um, but I think we have to really think about how our behavior affects other people. Yeah. Well, it's, it's awesome. And it actually looks really cool your satin yeah. black mask with your unbelievable eyes are those contacts those are contacts i am very 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 poorly sighted um and one cool thing about japan is you can buy contacts fairly easily um so yeah i get my prescription contacts that are like all white or red or whatever um usually on the internet or in donkey <laughs> um but yeah those are contacts and uh yeah the masks really highlight this part of your face so um i've been really leaning into eye makeup and leaning into color contacts and those kinds of you know from the nose up kind of <laughs> fashion statements that's amazing uh we have a comment from molly thanks for joining molly she says i'm making Hi. a quilt with some of my old clothes and that she's glad so grandma cool. taught her how to sew yeah. that's awesome I mean, even things that are like no longer wearable can still be usable. Um, you know, I mean, these Japanese floors are so hard to get clean. Like if something really goes to to crap, I'm just like, well, this is now a floor wiper. <laughs> just trying to get as much as you can out of what we have while it's here instead of buying new things. That makes so much sense. Uh, can you talk a little bit? I, I'm not, I don't know any other goths. Mm. I don't know much about goth fashion. Mm. And it seems like to me, just looking as an outsider, it seems like kawaii fashion, cute fashion, and uh, goth fashion seems to interplay a lot in Japan. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so I think there's like the core goth, um, which is like, more traditional goth which is very much you know like the black and dark um, um kind of coming out of like what we would think of like british goth or like american goth scenes from the 80s and the early 90s and those scenes definitely still exist in japan um but they're a lot more niche and they've gotten smaller um i think a lot of the people who are into those kind of goth scenes have matured so we're in our late 30s our 40s our 50s now and so it's a much more mature scene but the younger generation has really um, melded this idea of like the darkness and the sadness and kind of somewhat nihilism of goth with the cuteness of Japanese street fashion. And so you get things like um, Yame Kawaii, which is like the melding of like mental health issues with cute fashion, lots of syringes and pills and those kinds of things. Um, I think it's a very much, um, oh, output of Japan not wanting to be too straightforward with their things. Um, mental health is such a hard issue to talk about in this country. And so to make it more appealing, they've kind of melded it with these images that are not so abrasive um, and created their own thing. And I think that's amazing. I definitely think that um, subcultures need to evolve and change and 
adapt to where they are. Um, I don't really believe in this like whole gatekeeping idea that if you don't listen to the cure, then you can't be goth. Um, there are all kinds of goths. There's been all kinds of goths and punks and, you know, new wave and post romantics. Like there's those kinds of people have existed and changed and adapted for the last 30, 40 years. And um, I think Japan does a wonderful job at taking what is relevant to them and what's culturally relevant here and blending it with other things. Um, and that's no different within the golf subcultures as well. Um, because they're niche, niche kind of like um, subcultures, I feel like a lot of the times we kind of interplay. So there's like dark drag shows, um, like, you know, House of Schwartz, they do like gothic drag shows. And then there's like dark EDM DJs like DD Season, And there's like, um, Mistress Maya, who does like Kimbaku, but also does like EDM and, um, you know, kind of dark wave and industrial DJing. And because we're such a small groups, we kind of have to overlap. But I think there's a lot of mutual respect within the groups for like, um, just a love of like darkness and also like a love of being able to say like, yes, I may have problems or yes, I may struggle with these things, but I found a way to celebrate them. I like that. I like that idea. All about uh, showing your individuality and not being scared. I yeah. think Japan has an image, right, of pounding the nail that sticks out down yes. and uh, enforcing, con you know, everybody to be conform and be the same. Um, but I see so much creativity in Japan, especially when it comes to fashion. Um, so I'm so glad to see you and you embracing that scene. Have you been, have you felt like you've been welcomed in um, Japan for yeah. your diversity? Nobody says anything um, to you? There are definitely people who uh, don't, I'm, I have several tattoos, so, um, I'm definitely not the most heavily tattooed person, but I do have quite a few tattoos and um, Japan isn't the most tattoo friendly place, I would say. I probably get more stares and comments about having tattoos than I do about other things. Um, I honestly live in a fairly small, like a nice little suburban suburb area, suburban area. My neighbors are all super nice to me. We all speak to each other. Um, the flower lady gives my kids flowers. The dango lady gives my kids dangos. Like, I think um, there is probably some initial hesitation from the way that I present myself. But um, once people have talked to me and have gotten to know me, um, I think at the end of the day, Japanese people are no different than other people. They're going to probably judge all the book by the cover until they can understand the contents. Um, so I think if you make an effort to try to show the people around you that, you know, yes, I look different, but that is okay. Like the different types of people aren't bad. Um, and that this image that Japan maybe has created of people with tattoos or people who look different, that's just an image. Like all the goths and all the punks I know and all like the metal dudes I know are some of the best nicest kindest parents and like straight up helpful people I've ever met in my entire life um and they do get judged they do get called scary they do get called um you know intimidating or those kinds of things and get assumptions made about like their professions or what they do or what kind of people they are but um I think ultimately if you stay the course and just show people that you are a good person Sensible people will be sensible and see you for who you are. And if they can't see behind the image, then I don't really want to associate with those kind of people. Uh, there was a beautiful film just uh, featured by NPR in America called Living While Black in Japan. And there was a woman in the film called Ebony, yeah, I believe. And, yeah. and that wasn't you, right? No, 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 that's the okay. other Ebony. Um, and and she she is uh, she's like kawaii fashion. Yeah, she, uh, she wears a Lolita, lot of gothic Lolita. Thing, right? mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so I, I, I was watching this film and I, I was so happy that it was getting some, some like discussion and uh, highlighting how people of color might feel in Japan versus America. Um, is there anything that you saw in the film that kind of reflected your experience? 
I know for a fact that I, as a biracial person, get a lot of passes in Japan. Um, I am have always been what people call ethnically ambiguous, so no one can really tell what I am. Um, they usually make an assumption by whatever the predominant population that looks the most like me around is. Um, so in Nagoya, lots of people spoke Portuguese to me. Um, back home in California, lots of people speak Spanish to me. When I was in Sri Lanka, lots of people thought I was a burger. Like, uh, it definitely depends on where I am. Um, in Berkeley, I took Hindi, so everyone thought I was part Indian. Um, it's, it's reflective of whatever their worldview is. But I do know that um, am I treated the way maybe a blonde white girl in Japan will be treated? Definitely not. Um, I don't get the same kinds of automatic you're cute or automatic you are a certain kind of way assumptions. Um, do I get the kind of um, very blatant racism and very blatant um, xenophobia that more visibly black people in Japan get? Absolutely not. Um, I know for a fact, walking with friends who are not biracial, who are just black, that they have get, gotten far more uh, harassment, they get far more condemnation, and they struggle far more in the same companies, in the same positions, the same jobs, even if they're more qualified than me, even if they have, you know, better work records than me. Um, it's definitely something that influences people who are more visibly black than me's lives in Japan. Um, there's no doubt about that in my mind. Um, so I always recognize that while yes, I am black and I was raised in an all black family, culturally I am only black. Um, visibly, I'm never going to have the experience of another black person in Japan. Um, and recognizing that privilege, I try to use it as much as I possibly can to call people out when they feel like they're in a safe space to say what they want to say because they don't think there's a black person in the room. I think that's that's awesome to hear your your insight. And it's so important to just keep talking about people's real experiences, like real people, hearing yes. it from from real people directly. That's that's what we need more discussion, more representation of Absolutely. every every time you have a foreigner on TV, it's not just a white person. Yeah. Like there it's, is there is diversity in Japan, right? There's a lot of diversity in Japan. And like what I find when I watch television is that often they'll get stuck on having just one person speak for everyone. So, oh, we found our one black person that we're going to now have them speak on all the issues. And like, I definitely think those voices are so important and I'm glad that they are there. But you can't you there's no detriment in having a variety of voices all you're going to get is a broad range of perspectives and a broad range of lived experiences and at any given time we can speak for ourselves but we can't really speak for everyone i can never speak for all biracial women i can never speak for all you know women with adhd i can't speak for all goths i can't speak for all single moms i can only speak for ebony um, this is my lived experience, and this is how I've experienced living in Japan. And also, this is how I've experienced living as a woman in Japan. Like, those are my experiences. Um, and the only way we're going to ever get to a place is if we start li listening, truly listening to other people's experiences, and then taking a step back and wondering, why is their lived experience so different from my own? Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you so much. And I appreciate how outspoken you are. I think Dave and Osaka mentioned that before as well. But we, we need more people who just speak their truth because we need that represented, right? Yeah, I try as much as possible not to just go for like the, you know, knee jerk reaction of whatever you're saying is ridiculous. I don't want to hear it. Um, but I also feel like a lot of the times some voices are overrepresented. Some voices always are being heard and they don't really think about how is it that my voice is the dominant voice of foreigners in Japan or my voice is the dominant voice of black people in Japan or my voice is the dominant voice of women in Japan. Like, why are those voices the ones we're always hearing? And my voice is small. It's not, you know, I'm not anyone important, but I feel like I need to speak my truth because um, sometimes one person speaking their truth is the catalyst. So other people need to speak their truth. Um, when it came to someone saying that Japan was so safe for women, 
because it was a numbers game, I was very offended because I have been sexually assaulted in this country multiple times. And me talking about that openly, even though it's a very hard subject to brace, led to like 800 likes and a whole bunch of women talking about what they've experienced in Japan. And I think it really kind of opened a lot of people's eyes to, you know, what you see in a statistic or what you see on the news is not necessarily reflective of what women are experiencing in this country. That's so important. I think uh, I, not only on social media, but another way recently that you are expressing your point of view and empowering not only yourself, but empowering others is through your poetry. Let's talk a little bit about your new book. You published yeah. a book of poetry. Congratulations. Yes. So, yeah, um, at the beginning of this year, I published, um, I still published my first book of poetry. Um, actually, that book of poetry basically started off as a way for me to process in real time um, a, I don't want to say relationship, but an, I don't know, entanglement <laughs> um, that was occurring. Um, and I just wasn't really dealing with my feelings um, the way I wanted to. Um, I actually started writing quite young, um, maybe like first or second grade, and I got published fairly early, like third or fourth grade. Um, and then there was a point in my life where I hit a very strong writer's block, um, especially during my marriage. I just was so emotionally stopped up that there was no way for me to really even express myself in words. Um, and then this um, entanglement happened and it was like something just unleashed inside of me. I often describe it as like I was a woman possessed. Um, I barely ate, I barely slept, but I wrote, I woke up in the middle of the night writing, I went to sleep writing, I wrote on the train, I wrote everywhere. Um, and then I narrowed it down to the poems that are in that book. Um, and even though it took me a long couple of months, uh, several months of being absolutely devastated, um, I did eventually work my way out of that heartache um, and found, you know, a new sense of self and a new sense of peace. Um, but I'm really grateful because after that heartache passed, the muse never left. And so I'm still steadily writing. I'm actually probably three fourths um, of the way through the second book that I plan to put out at the end of the year. Oh, that's awesome to hear. I've ordered mine. It hasn't come yet. But if you're like me and you're looking for little uh, insights into Ebony's poetry, have a look at her Twitter feed and her Instagram feed, and yes. you can see some samples. Now, it's not just it's not just poetry per se. You have some which are positive affirmations, yeah. which I find so empowering. Would you read some for us? Yes. Um, did you want me to read some of those affirmations? Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I try to um, really use whatever I know or whatever I've found in myself um, to kind of empower other people. I don't know much, but... Um, so I guess they're not really affirmations so much as my feelings on things. Like I have never quite figured out how to find someone without losing myself. Um, and that's just a really reflection of often when I like a person, I become hyper-focused um, on that person. And so then I think about them and what they like and what they want and their needs. But my needs are also important. Um, and I need to kind of focus on those kinds of things. Um, one of the things I'm really, really focused on right now is um, trying to bring out and bring forth stories of black women in softness because I'm tired of strength narratives. Um, I really feel like we get pigeonholed so often, like, oh, you're so strong, you're so strong. And I'm just frankly tired of hearing that. Like, yes, I am strong, but I'm also soft and I'm also vulnerable and I'm also weak. And sometimes I'm, you know, I need help just like anybody else. Um, and so I've really been kind of writing towards that as well. Um, so like one of the poems that I wrote um, is an ode to black women. So I think that's what I really wanna read, if that's okay. Of course, go for it. Okay. An Ode to Black Women 
Before you ask about the scars upon our backs or the blisters on our souls or the pain that haunts our past or the wounds in our hearts or the grief of our loss, please ask us about the flowers in our hair, the sun upon our skin, the song in our voices, the dance in our walk, the beauty in our essence. Please see us, not as tragedy or endurance, but as we are, our truest form, the origin of all life. So That's as a, an anthropologist, I um, know that, you know, life started in Africa and I really just want people to start seeing black women as more than what we survive. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. Now that reminds me of your work with Jazz House Publications. Yes, yes. It might be a good time to mention that. Yeah, uh, we, um, we Dream of Flowers. Yeah, project, so currently it? Jazz House is working through some retooling and um, reconfiguring of the company. So things are kind of being pushed back. But yes, um, I'm taking submissions for an anthology um, called We Dream of Flowers. Um, and I just really want to be able to highlight and um, put out into the world other black women's stories of like softness, vulnerability, um, joy, um, connection. There's just so much about black womanhood that is centered around things that is, are not the core of who we are. Um, one of the things I told the other Ebony about her um, appearance in the NPR thing was I was so glad she dressed the way that she liked because I feel like there needs to be more representation of there is more than one way to be black. There is more than one way to be a black woman. And we don't have to fit into any box that you create for us. Um, and I'm, I love every representation of black women. Like I think we definitely need women who are strong and sexy and powerful. And we need women who are meek or more, you know, timid or girls who will dress more modestly and girls who wear highlighter and girls who don't wear makeup at all and girls who have natural hair and girls who have big giant weaves or girls who have braids and girls who have twist outs and dreads. I think we need everything to be represented and for all of that to be validated. Um, and I really just want to give other women a chance to say, this is my story. This is my story of softness. This is my story of beauty. Um, and that is kind of what we, what we Dream of Flowers are about. Um, when I was trying to think of the title, my friend sent me a cup that says, I am my ancestors' wildest dreams. And I was trying to think, what would my ancestors dream about? And that phrase is often used like, oh, well, I'm a CEO or I have money. And like, I just personally don't feel like my ancestors in America were dreaming about capitalism working in a freaking cotton field. I personally think they were dreaming about being able to walk in a flower field, being able to enjoy leisure, being able to enjoy family, being able to enjoy connection and history and folklore, um, these kinds of things. So when I think of what my ancestors wildest dreams are, it's always a field of flowers. That's beautiful. I love that. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention before we move on is about Jazz House Publications. Mm -hmm. It seems like a wonderful organization based in Seattle, but they yes. do work around the world. Is that right? Um, so, yeah, they're a small publishing house. They just got started a year ago. And obviously with like Corona and all the things, it's um, making it a little bit more difficult for things to really take off the way that they want. Um, but um, yeah, they're open to submissions all over the world and writers all over the world. Um, they really wanna try to provide a platform for people to tell their own stories um, in ways that they feel are authentic and true. Um, and um, not so much having people talk over you. Um, a lot of the times the stories that are told about us are through the lens of the people who are telling them and not through our own lens. Um, and just coming back to everyone's lived experience is different and trying to give people the opportunity to just talk about their own lived experiences or even through fiction, fictionalized versions of their own experiences um, and kind of broadening who are the voices in the room, um, especially with writers. If you look at like publications, um, just the overwhelming majority of writers 
are men. The overwhelming majority of writers tend to be white, especially in publishing houses. Um, and trying to just really say like other voices deserve a chance to speak up as well. Um, not passing the mic basically, because it's very easy to speak for someone, but it's much better if you just let them speak for themselves. That's wonderful. It seems like a, a great project. Um, wait, is there a way for people to sign up online through Jazz House Publications? Yeah, there or? is a page for um, the submissions um, and it'll be getting updated soon because we were hoping for this year, but now we're looking at Black History Month next year. Okay, great. Um, can you share another poem with us yes. from your book? Okay, so I'm going to share this poem that um, I think is kind of a good amalgamation of how living in Japan kind of seeps into you um, and influences what you write. Um, so this poem is called Kintsugi, which um, as you may know is the Japanese art of mending broken things with gold to make them whole again. Kintsugi. I want to turn this useless flesh into gold, perform alchemy on this being, and pour myself liquid light into all your broken pieces, every crack and crevice, until you are imperfect and whole. I love that. And uh, that. there is one more. Um, and I think the poem that started this whole process, shall I say, um, was I actually took a photo of my hand where there is a scar and then I um, superimposed it. But um, basically it's a poem about the first day I met a person and then they kind of just spiraled from there. And that poem is called March 12th, um, March 12th. On the day we met, I cut my left hand on a plastic menu, the smallest of scratches and blood bubbled to the surface and it would not heal for days and days. And when it did, it left a scar and it was such a ridiculous thing and I hated it until I realized that my body never wanted me to forget and I am scared it will fade away. Um, and the funny thing is that scar is now starting to fade um, because if there's a testament to anything is that the scars in your heart and the scars on your body, you will heal. Yeah. And at the at the time you think it's going to be forever, yeah. And you'll you you'll never forget, you'll never heal. And amazingly, one day you look back and you can't remember clearly. You've gotten over it, right? Yeah. I mean, there are definitely still days where I think back to crying on the shower floor for three months straight and feeling like I was going to perish from dehydration or perhaps drown in my own tears. Um, and now I see this person and all I can think is, I wish you well. Good for you. That's so hard. But this month is World Suicide Prevention Month. So it's really important to be talking about the difficult feelings and working through things that are emotionally hard so that you can get over them, even if it takes three months yeah, I definitely, my second book is actually just about how I've dealt with like a lifetime of trauma. And I think people often say, well, you're very resilient. And I don't know if I'm resilient. I feel like sometimes the only choice you have is to keep moving forward. And there have been a few times in my life where I didn't feel like I could do that anymore. Um, so I feel like there's been a lot of growth on my part. Um, and also I have a child, so that definitely changes your perspective about the meaning of life. Um, but yes, you, you, you learn how to recover and you learn how to bounce back. And maybe you're a little bit dented, maybe you're a little bit scratched, but I don't think those dents and scratches make you any less worthy. I think they're just a reflection of a life lived. Um, and so, I've stopped apologizing for being hurt and I've stopped apologizing for having a past and I've stopped apologizing for feeling I'm a person. Um, and so, yeah, the, the pain is there and then you grow from it. And then sometimes bad things happen and there's no reason whatsoever. You didn't deserve it. It just happened. Um, but you move forward because what other choice do you really have? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Molly had a great comment. Your poetry is beautifully moving. Thank you so very much. Um, so I want to read one last poem. Um, it's actually the last poem in the book, and it's called The End, and I kind of think it uh, ties back to what we were just talking about. The End. There's no need to worry. I will be okay, or perhaps I won't, but I will survive, like countless times before. You are not the biggest tragedy in my life. You are just the latest. That's awesome. I love that. And it's, yeah, don't give the person causing you tragedy too much credit. No. I think we want to find meaning in pain because then it doesn't feel so pointless. But sometimes bad things just happen and all you can do is try to navigate that the best way you can while keeping your own soul intact. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that awesome poetry. And I, I can't wait till my book gets here. I need a little dose of Ebony Brown every day so Thank I can you. keep inspired and keep going. <laughs> um, let's, yeah. <laughs> We, we haven't talked much about being a single parent in Tokyo, um, especially as a, a, an outsider, a yeah. non-Japanese single parent. How, how are you finding everything? How's your son doing? Um, so I actually share um, custody of my child. So he lives with me one week on, one week off. Um, and we make all decisions in regards to schooling and those kinds of things together. Um, and we still do birthdays together. Um, that is not always the easiest thing to navigate for me um, in terms of dealing with another parent and co-parenting with a person you don't necessarily have the best relationship with, but I'm doing my best. Um, I find that there is just really not a lot of support here for parents who are not Japanese. Um, my child's other parent is also not Japanese. And so to be honest, if we didn't both speak Japanese to the level that we speak Japanese, I don't really know how I would have navigated it thus far. Um, there's just, first, I'm sure everyone knows, there's just an endless amount of paperwork that gets sent home, just nonstop, relentless paperwork. And there's never any explanation or any kind of like understanding that perhaps parents who aren't Japanese won't understand this. Um, it's not just the language barrier. There's also just a completely different set of rules and a completely different way of doing things that I personally have never experienced. So things that seem very, oh yeah, that's, you know, I what's a tiny my in English, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's expected. Or expected. That's normal, I yeah. have no idea what those things are. Um, so I, I have to go and say, hey, I don't know what this is. I've never, I wasn't required to take these mini bags to school. Just show me what I need to make. Or um, uh, there's also the gap between like, even things like I got, I've been chastised for feeding my child food that's too yummy at home. Um, because, you know, the school food is very, flavor profile is very mild and my child was used to a higher flavor profile and so I was told you know you need to make sure you match the food at home to the food at school um, and I understand wanting them to eat but I also think that there's not a lot of understanding that like food is one way people stay connected to their cultures and I don't want to feed my child Japanese food 24 7 because I want him to have a connection to Sri Lanka and I want him to have a connection to like black American food culture. And so um, does, they don't really think about that, I think. Um, I don't think they mean to be intrusive, but um, those kinds of things aren't taken into account. Um, and also as a mom who works full time, um, I don't know how they expect us to be everywhere and everything at all times. And, and to have all the special bags. Well, you sew, so it'd be easier for you. I made all of them, yeah. You but, have um, to make special bags for yeah. every school year and it has to have a certain size. And this is something that I struggled with who cannot sew. I love to see that your, your son has embraced your love for Halloween 
a little bit of goth fashion he in him. Is <laughs> the, he might out goth me one day, to be honest. He just loves all things creepy, all things scary. Um, and I think it's really cool because he's really blended it with the fact that he was born and raised in Tokyo. So he's all about all things yokai and like Japanese ghosts and Japanese like ghost house and these weird Japanese like monster games that he loves. But he also really likes, you know, just good old fashioned scary movies with mommy. And yeah, he's just he's a spooky kid. <laughs> Um, I definitely didn't force it on him, but uh, he's embraced it 100%. So uh, fashion-wise, he's he's still pretty into like wearing Pokemon and Minecraft and Mario Brothers. But then he'll slap on like a horror mask at Daiso to compliment his Pokemon t-shirt. <laughs> Uh, well, it, it looks like uh, you are also coming up into your element with Halloween coming yes. up. Are yeah. you crafting your heart away? I am making a few outfits. I always make at least one like big showstopper like um, outfit for Halloween. So I'm really excited to make some stuff to wear for Halloween um, and also maybe do a little bit of shopping. This is definitely the most wonderful time of the year for me. Um, it's when I do most of my home decor shopping and also most of my, um, you know, dinnerware, serviceware. Um, I'm really, really lucky to have friends back home who are willing to send me scare packages full of Halloween goodies um, every year. So I am pretty stoked about shopping, as you can probably tell. Um, I really like that Japan has started to embrace Halloween over these years. Um, when I moved here 14 years ago, Halloween wasn't that big a deal. Um, but it's definitely picked up speed. And um, I've got some really cool things this year, like traditional Japanese toys painted in like Halloween style um, with like zombies and stuff. And I think that's really cool as well. Just to see like the blending of cultures makes me really happy. Yeah. And you'll have to come to Hiroshima sometime in one of the small suburbs. They do a zombie night wow. and they they let zombies and people, cosplayers also mix in and they just take over all the streets. I'm too scared to go. Well, that definitely like, does sound you like would love it. the plot of <laughs> a horrifying horror movie in which people would get stabbed. I would love it. <laughs> so that's going to be on the top of my list when I come to Hiroshima. That would be great. Plus, you must know about uh, in Osaka, there's Trick or Treat Sweets. Yeah. She was on the series before. She makes these amazing cakes and everything she makes looks like old 1950s Americana. Wow. Like it's all like, yeah, amazing I stuff. I did not and know it's all about that, weird. but I will look it up because I like making cakes, but they're never very cute. <laughs> Yeah, I saw one of the pictures you were making a funetti cake or something. Yeah, I, I enjoy baking as a stress reliever, but um, drawing and cake decoration are not my strong suits. I do make my child a theme cake for his birthday every year um, to give him a taste of like American style birthday parties. Um, but they're always more love than uh, talent. <laughs> Well, that's good, too. Yeah, I that was always my excuse uh, with my kids. My cakes never looked amazing, but I always aim for as long as they taste good, I'm happy. You know, <laughs> yeah. definitely a nailed it baker. Yeah. Well, there's um two. There's only two more minutes. We've talked about so much. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you wanted to mention? Ah. Uh... I can't really think of anything. I just, I want to say that, like, I really think if you are in Japan and you're struggling or you're feeling lonely or you feel like you're not really making connections, um, don't be afraid to just put yourself out there and reach out to people online. I mean, I have some of my best friends now. I literally, Farah, who's uh, really popular on Twitter as well. Um, like, those are friends I made through Twitter because I just had the gumption to say, hey, person, would you like to be my friend? And I know that sounds really strange to be a 37-year-old woman who just inboxes people and says, hey, do you want to go get a cup of coffee? Or, hey, do you want to go to this weird art exhibit or something? But um, 
that's the only way you're going to really meet people. And especially with the current pandemic where you can't just really gather with a bunch of people. Um, I know isolation is a big thing, but you can still meet people and you can still make those connections. Um, but especially with, you know, how it's being World Suicide Month and stuff. And um, just so many people in Tokyo I see are really, really lonely, not just Tokyo, all of Japan. Um, Sometimes you have to put yourself out there. And if you're in Tokyo and you see me, say hi. Or if you're in Tokyo and you want to have a cup of coffee, I'm always willing. Yeah. I, I hope you don't mind me sharing. Your pinned tweet is so powerful. And yeah. you have so many amazing comments from people. It's unbelievable. That tweet is like, if you're having a bad day, go read that tweet. Go read the comments in that tweet and just remember that like connection can happen at any time it's amazing yeah and you can find a good community on twitter yes, or haps yeah. or anywhere that you invest your time and try to help other people and yeah. support other people usually it comes back right yeah as long as you're putting good into the world i really truly believe that good will come back to you so yes twitter can sometimes be a nightmare escape and we don't always show our best faces there but I think if you're more like you're putting in more good than you're putting in negativity, then you'll start attracting that. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Ebony, for joining today and sharing about your thank life you. and uh, all your amazing creative things that you're up to. Keep up the good work. Thank and you. This was wonderful. Thank you so much. And everybody, please check out Orange on uh amazon is yes. probably the easiest place right yes. yes amazon it's available on amazon thank you and uh, we'll we'll put a link below thank you thank so you. much for your comments and questions everybody thank you so much ebony thank everybody have too. a great weekend take care you too. bye, bye.